Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is great to be with you as we gather together for worship and celebrate World Communion Sunday. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Peter Thompson. I'm one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church of Lynchburg, and I want to welcome you to this time of worship together. I'm here this morning with Chad and with Kat and with Kathleen and with Corey. Also with us this morning is Gary Stroud, who will be um, offering music later in our service. Again, it is great to be with you, and we do welcome you to this time. It is a special occasion today as we gather together for World Communion Sunday. We wear our stoles, um, this stole and the one Chad is wearing, as well as the skirts that the, the ladies are wearing, um, are a part of our partnership with, with the church and our brothers and sisters in Africa, uh, in Malawi, and in that area. And so we celebrate with them today. We break bread with them today and share the cup. We will also hear from Reverend John Gondaway later in our service with the Lord's Prayer. And so we, uh, we welcome him to our time uh, together as well. I want to take just a moment and I want to thank our Chancel Guild for all of their work, for the Chancel Flowers that they've been providing throughout the summer uh, for both our outside and our inside services um, as you can tell, it is the season of harvest as we've moved into October, uh, and I want to thank all of them for their, uh, the gifts and the, the skills that they share in helping us bring life um, into this space. I want to welcome you as well for those of you who are able to come participate and walk with God. Um, the weather has been just right in the evenings and late afternoons, and so we welcome you at 4.30 this afternoon to gather in the back parking lot and to come walk. It's about a two and a half mile walk, takes about 40 minutes or so. Um, all paces are welcome and you are uh, welcome to bring a friend and come, a stroller if that's needed as well. And we look forward to time spent together. I also want to share and invite uh, you to join in church work days on behalf of our facilities committee, uh, both Saturday, October the 17th and Saturday, October the 24th have been designated from 8.30 in the morning to 11.30 in the morning to do some cleanup around the grounds here at the church. So we welcome you to come and to, to plan and to be a part of that as you are able. Again, it is great to be with you. Let us continue in our worship together.
Let us pray. The word of the Lord is perfect. God's word revives the soul. The decrees of God never fail. Our hearts rejoice. The word of God shines clear. Our eyes are enlightened. The word of the Lord endures forever. Blessed be God's holy name. Almighty God, your word burst forth into our lives like a glorious sunrise. You speak and our hearts rejoice. You command and our eyes are opened. The sound of your voice brings revival to our souls. Your words are purer than the finest gold. O oh Lord, you are God. There is no other God but you. We worship you. We praise and honor your name. We worship you on this, your holy day. For your love, for your word, for all that you have given. Gracious God, we thank you and praise you. And God, we confess to you all that we have allowed to come between us. For no matter how righteous we imagine ourselves to be, Lord, your perfect word reveals our imperfections all too clearly. No matter how hard we strive to fulfill the requirements of your law, we always fall short. We have forgotten that righteousness and perfection come not from rules and regulation, but from faith. We have ignored the truth that your righteousness comes from faith. Open our eyes so that we can see all that we have accomplished so that all that we have accomplished is nothing, nothing compared to knowing Christ as our Lord. And let us count everything as loss, that we might gain heaven and be found blameless in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we approach God's holy word, would you join me in a prayer for illumination? Let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Lord, make us hungry for this, your word, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Our first Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, various verses. Listen for the word of the Lord. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And picking up at verse 7, You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. And finally in verses 12 to 20, Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. 
You shall, not, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witness the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. And our Psalter reading comes from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired, than they, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression." Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And our New Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh. I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as a loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as a loss because of the surpassing value of knowing God, Jesus, and my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered loss, the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the sharing of His sufferings by becoming like him in his death. And if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not 
that I have already obtained this, or that I have already reached this goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Jesus Christ has made me His own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of which is the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. That is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you to Chad and to Kathleen and to Kat for sharing those readings. Have you ever been to see a doctor? I know that some of you are doctors and some of you are married to doctors, but what I'm really referring to is is a medical visit in, in which you've had to, a need to seek medical advice or perhaps even get a prescription for something. Has anyone not? I mean, even young children, bless their hearts, my own children included, get prescribed something early on in their life. It's really hard to think of life without some kind of prescription remedy for the ailments and the aches and the pains and the twisty, twirly, topsy-turvy, I'll call it, stuff of life. What about for life itself, though? Is there such a prescription Does life have a prescription? Yes. Yes, it does. As I looked at Psalm 19 this week, there were six somethings that caught my attention in the text, and it caused me to dig deeper for this morning. The Psalm's perpetual in nature and powerfully poetic, and I'm going to ask Chad and Kathleen and Kat to to come back up and and to hold up some letters. As they're getting said, I'll I'll share that Psalm 19, it, it emerges out of the lawful language of Exodus 20 that Chad read when when Moses declared God's law to the Israelites and and it builds a solid foundation for the humbled stature of stature of the of the apostle Paul the text that Cat read Paul was a relatively new follower of Jesus but a passionate and a convicted one based on the glory of of the Lord shown on him as I thought about these things and about the state and temperature of all that is around us today, Psalm 19 emerged not only as a bridge to the Exodus and the Philippians texts, which span a very, very long period of time, but as a prescription for life. Not just life in ancient Israel or in the early days of the Christian church, but right here. Right now. P-S-C-R-P-T. Did you hear what David wrote in Psalm 19? The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And the ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. P-S-C-R-P-T Perfect, sure, clear, right, pure, and true. Does anyone else long for a prescription to life that is perfect, that is sure, that is clear, that is right, that is pure, that is true? Can you see the consonants making 
prescript, a prescription. Thank you all. So again, I'll ask, do do any of you long for a prescription of life that is perfect and sure, clear, right, pure, and true? Well, the good news, there is good news for us today because, well, who does not love to hear good news? And, And who could not use good news this morning? That perfect and sure and clear and right and pure and true prescription, that vaccine for the spiritual viruses of life are found in the Lord. This is the good news of the Gospel. This is the good news that we encounter when we are rooted in God and found reaching for God's love and salvation. For the Lord is perfect and sure, clear, right, pure and true. Now as I read Psalm 19 over and over, I began to ask a few questions. You know, what must have David been doing when he wrote Psalm 19? I mean, what what happened beforehand? Where was he? What time of day was it? What was he looking at? What, What was he sitting or standing on? Was his heart beating fast in anticipation or or in excitement? Was he awestruck and speechless so he had to write it down? Had he been humbled by life in some way? You know, imagination and speculation, reading into the psalm, give us a few suggestions, but there's no exact certainty to those answers. But what has been determined and is very helpful for us is to reflect very briefly on the sources for which David was declaring the glory of the Lord. And that is nature and the Word. The imagery of creation, including the heavens as a dome, as though we are living under God's umbrella. The complexity of time from day to day with the rising of the sun bursting onto the scene. The warmth of the sun guiding through the noonday. And the setting of the sun resting and turning to nightfall. Creation is silent, David writes, and yet noisy at the same time. Each of these suggests David is outside on the countryside. A place where he witnesses both the rising and the setting of the sun. The beauty of nature is one of David's sources for knowing God's glory. Well, David then turns to the Word. The Word David is referring is not the same Bible that we have today. We only had, he only had the Pentateuch or, or the first five books of the Bible. And I'm, I'm sure he had a few other sources to draw upon as well, not the least of which would have been the history of Israel passed on verbally from generation to generation. As king, I'm sure his resources were as vast as any. It was God's Word though. It was God's Word that spoke to David. The law, the decrees, the precepts, the commandments, and the ordinances of God, they they exploded with, with awe and wonder, not boredom and burden. Amid His kingly duties, God's Word provided Him a center, a focus, a purpose, and an assurance. And then the psalm turns, and and as it concludes, it suggests a prayer, a conversation with God in which David humbles himself and acknowledges God as God and himself as a child of God. A humble hope sums it all up. Let the words of my mouth, which can be sticky and dangerous, and the meditation of my heart, which can have a tendency to wander, be acceptable to You, 
my rock, in which I believe David may have very well have been sitting on or standing on as he wrote. And my Redeemer, a declaration of glory to God for God's love and mercy and the joy of life encompasses in that love and mercy. Now, any good prescription right, comes with directions for use. Well, the doctor goes over with us how we are to take the medication, how often, and, and even reviews any side effects that we might experience. Well, for the Lord as perfect, sure, clear, right, pure, and true, that prescription, the directions present to us a model of righteousness. A model of righteousness in which we are to follow and live by. For the Lord's prescription to work effectively, David suggests, well, how are we to take the medication? First, we breathe. We be in contact with God daily as often as you breathe the air that God has provided. Secondly, we listen. We listen for God's voice and follow God's guidance. And thirdly, we go. We don't sit back passively, but we go. We're active with God. For God is on the loose and we must keep up with God so that we can be faithful in being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Well, how often are we to take this prescription? Well, second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. You see, God does not take time outs from us. And neither should we take time outs from God. Side effects. Well, David writes the side effect to this prescription as the glory of the Lord is it's a great reward. It's an everlasting joy. It's an unconditional love. It's an unfailing peace. Now the model of righteousness also includes two other things that we as as the church can do to celebrate and embody our Lord as perfect, sure, clear, right, pure, and true. The first is to celebrate the sacrament of communion. Now today is World Communion Sunday. And on this day, we are reminded of the wider meaning of Holy Communion. Koinonia is the Greek term. That the church rises from the table and is sent by the power of the Holy Spirit to participate in God's mission to the world. To limit our love, relationship, and concerns to those who who simply assemble with us at the table is, is called fencing the table. So that it includes only the gathered community. And it blocks from our vision those who do not gather physically at our table so that we do not see the people of God everywhere. But the one, the one who invites us to the table reminds us that we are to live as the divine host lived. We are empowered to remember to seek reconciliation with Christ and and, an act that compels reconciliation also with one another, even those not gathered at the table. Accepting the invitation to come to the Lord's feast demands that we actively seek reconciliation in every instance of conflict or division between ourselves and our neighbors. Not just here at First Presbyterian Church. Not just in your homes. Not just in Lynchburg. But our neighbors all around the world. We are invited to the table to be nurtured for Christ-like living. We are called to commit ourselves anew to love and serve God and one another. Now earlier this morning at our 9 o'clock service outside in the parking lot, we celebrated World Communion together by breaking the bread and pouring the cup. If you're at home 
wherever you are watching, the next time you have a chance to sit at a table, I invite you to take bread or take a cracker or something. Take time out. Take juice. Take wine. And recall the glory of the Lord and what it means to break bread together, to share the cup, and to be a part of God's holy family all around the world. Well, the second is to celebrate the sacrament of baptism. You see, today along with communion, we had the privilege to celebrate baptism as well. And celebrating baptism reminds us of a few things. It reminds us of hope. A hope that we have a purpose in this life to live for God. And unity. Unity with God through faith. One Lord, one church, one faith. And it reminds us of love. Like parents embracing a child, baptism reminds us of God's embrace of us. And community. Community because life is not meant to be played alone. A life embodying our baptisms is one spent in a community of support and encouragement and teaching and care. Baptism is a celebration of our sacred story. A holy script with God that began long ago, continues today, and will live on into eternity. Baptism is a celebration in which one of the most common and natural elements in the world, water, symbolizes the pouring of God's Spirit over us. Baptism is our public acceptance and claim of God's love in our life, not just an event that comes and goes. In and through our baptisms, we pray for God's care, guidance, protection, and deliverance to be with us. Austin Lee Coffee this morning outside was baptized, and it was a celebration of the community coming together in God's promises of God's love and claim upon our lives. To close our time together this morning, I want to invite you to close your eyes and be. Do your best to tune out all the other noises. Make sure your phone, if it's near you, is silent. Invite the kids, if they're in the house with you, to stop for just a moment and listen with you. Listen for the glory of the Lord. Imagine what David must have been doing, what he was looking at. Listen for the prescription of life. God's glory is on tour in the skies. God craft on exhibit across the horizon. Madam Day holds classes every morning. Professor Knight lectures each evening. Their words are not heard. Their voices aren't recorded. But their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. God makes a huge dome for the sun, a super dome. The morning's the morning sun's a new husband leaping from his honeymoon bed, the day breaking sun an athlete racing to the tape. That is how God's word vaults across the skies from sunrise to, to sunset. Melting ice, scorching deserts, warming hearts to faith. The revelation of God is whole and perfect and pulls our lives together. The signposts of God are clear and point out the right road. The life maps of God are right, showing the way to joy. The directions of God are plain and easy on the eyes. God's reputation is 24 karat gold with a lifetime guarantee. The decisions of God are accurate down to the nth degree. God's word is better than a diamond. 
better than a diamond set between emeralds. You will like it better than strawberries in spring, better than red, ripe strawberries. And there is more. God's Word warns us of danger and directs us to hidden treasure. Otherwise, how will we find our way or know when we play the fool? Clean the slate, God, so we can start the day fresh. Keep me from stupid sins, from thinking I can take over Your work. Then I can start this day sun-washed, scrubbed clean of the grime of sin. These are the words in my mouth. These are what I chew on and pray. Accept them when I place them on the morning altar. Oh God, my altar rock. God, priest of my altar. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our prescription for life, our model of righteousness is perfect, sure, clear, right, pure, and true. Our prescription for life, our model of righteousness is the Lord. Glory be to God. Let all God's people say, Amen. As we continue in worship, let us offer unto God a great prayer of thanksgiving and follow that by the Lord's Prayer as John Gondway, Reverend from Malawi, leads us. Let us pray. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent your only begotten, in whom your fullness dwells, to be for us the way and the truth and the life. Revealing your love, Jesus taught those who would hear him, healed those who believed in him, received all who sought him, and lifted the burden of their sin. You formed the universe in your wisdom and created all things by your power. You set us in families on the earth to live with you in faith. We praise you for good gifts of bread and wine and for the table you spread in the world this morning as a sign of your love for all people in Christ. We glorify you, Father, for your great power and love at work in Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death. 
and made us a new people by water and the Spirit. So we give thanks to you, Lord, that on the night of his arrest, before he died, he took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And whenever we drink it, to do this in remembrance of him. Therefore, in accordance with the Lord's commandment, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, and we await his coming in glory. Help us, O God, to love as Christ loved. Knowing our own weakness, may we stand with all who stumble. Sharing in his suffering, may we remember all who suffer. Held in his love, may we embrace all whom the world denies. Rejoicing in his forgiveness, may we forgive all who sin against us. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages, we'll feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ. And we pray now with Reverend John Gondway from Malawi, who will pray the Lord's Prayer in his native language of Timbuka. I invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer while John leads us. Vana David wa mri kuchanya ritumbikike zinarinu ofumo wenu weze kombo rinu chitike pasipano ngankuchanya mutipe chako charero ndipo mtigokere mateo yetu ngamu nase tabagokera mateo yetu Mungatoranga mkuyezgeka kwene mtitaske kuheni pakuti ufumo ngwenu na ngongono na uchindami wa mwiraira amen
Praise be to God. Thank you, Gary and Corey, and for all those who have served as the hands and the feet and the heart and the head of God in so many different ways here in Lynchburg, in our surrounding communities, and around the world. Let us pray. God, we thank You so much for all the blessings that You have bestowed on all of us. We thank You for the many gifts that You have given us, for the skills, for the talents, for the opportunities that we have had to be Your church. For the opportunity to serve, and to teach, to listen, to care, to give. We pray, Lord, that we can continue to be Your faithful children. The salt of the earth, the light of the world as You call us to. We thank You, Lord, for being the right prescription for our life. For being there for us. So that we can lean on You. We ask, Lord, that we can feel so empowered by the strength that You give us that we can in turn be there for others. With our time, with our talents, with our treasures. Lord, again, we thank You for all of Your blessings and for the opportunities we have to be a blessing. We pray all of this in Your Son's name. Let all God's people say, Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, fed by the Word that has been read, sung, and proclaimed, by the bread of life, the cup of salvation, the waters that pour over us with God's blessing, inspired by God's presence who is with us wherever it is that we are, let us now depart from this time together encouraged and empowered on the wings of the Holy Spirit who gives us the courage, the strength, and the hope that we need each and every day. Let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.